Well, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dean John R. Rosenberg, Dean of the College of Humanities at Brigham Young University. He has ser previously served as an Associate Dean and is Chair of the Spanish and Portuguese Department. Uh, Dean Rosenberg's research has been 19th and 20th century Spanish literature, which, he's included, uh, in, which has included travel to Spain over 50 times to conduct research in the areas of Spanish literature, and of late, the literature's connections with Spanish visual arts. The author of two books and editor of the third, he has written scholarly articles and participated frequently in national and international conferences. In 2007, the Institute for Educational Inquiry named him an Agenda for Education and a Democracy Scholar, and his Introduction to Hispanic Literature course was named one of the top 25 best world language courses at U.S. colleges and universities by the Educational Policy Improvement Center. As part of Dean Rosenberg's ongoing commitment to public education, he has received eight grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities to conduct summer seminars for teachers and serves on the management team of BYU's Center for the Improvement of Teaching and Schooling. And he was a leadership associate at the Institute for Educational Inquiry. Dean Rosenberg served a mission in Venezuela, received a BA in psychology and Spanish from BYU, and a PhD in Spanish literature from Cornell University. Thereafter, he returned to BYU to assume a full-time teaching position. He and his wife, uh, Gayla Marie Green, are the parents of two daughters. Today, Dean Rosenberg will be speaking on Humanities Plus, the case for a liberal arts education. Please join me in welcoming Dean John Rosenberg. Well, I'm delighted to be here. Um, delighted to see some friends here who are gonna keep me honest. Um, Tom from the south end of campus is going to make sure that I say things um, that are defensible about technology and science. And Nancy Christiansen in the back, I'm gonna uh, mention a thing or two uh, that she knows a whole lot more about than I do. And Nancy, if I get it wrong, stand up and say, no, no, uh, it actually needs to be understood, understood this way. Um, I'm interested in knowing in who you are, students. Um, uh, how many of you would consider yourselves to be students of the liberal arts? Almost all of you. So this is good. This is singing with the choir. Um, and um, um, I'm not quite sure uh, whether I'm going to run out of material before I run out of time. Uh, if that's the case, we'll have a conversation uh, in the remaining time. It's more likely I'm going to run out of time before I run out of material, in which case we'll just stop uh, at, uh, at 10 minutes to 12. I would like to correct the title. The title is, is a great one that, that uh, Corey gave us, uh, The Case for a Liberal Arts Education. I would rather make it A Case for a Liberal Arts Education. I don't think there is just a single case that one might make, and I'm quite sure uh, that if Corey were to have the bad judgment to invite me back and repeat the talk a month from now, I would make a different case than the one that I'm making now. But the most critical thing from my point of view is not um, the case or a case that I might make, but the case that you as liberal arts students will need to make uh, at some point. A case that you will need to make uh, to family members, uh, to roommates, uh, 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 to parents, uh, to potential employers. Uh, in fact, uh, in my mind, the most critical learning outcome for a liberal arts student uh, is the first one, which what I would say, learn to be articulate about why you have chosen a liberal arts major and to be able to describe to others who are not in the liberal arts just why that major matters and how it prepares you for the world of work uh, and for the world of, of living in general. I hope that the things that I um, amuse uh, myself about over the next 50 minutes uh, might help you in making your own case for a liberal arts, uh, a liberal arts education. Um, let's start with um, a... Um, a statement that was made about 60 years ago by faculty at the University of Chicago as they were putting together their general education program. And at a time when uh, gendered language was not uh, the same uh, kind of sin that it is today, they gave us this statement, which I think is terrific. Men are born free, they are not born wise. The purpose of a liberal education in a democracy is to make free men wise. There seems to be suggested in this very simple 
aphorism um, that somehow freedom and democracy and moral living are connected with an acquired wisdom, something that we're not born with, but that we must learn through the hard work um, of discipline, and that somehow the liberal arts are tied up in that process um, of acquiring the knowledge and the skills that we need to be free um, in a democratic society and to live a moral life. Well, perhaps we ought to uh, uh, try to unpack a little bit uh, exactly what we mean by the term liberal arts, liberal. Now there's a scary word in the heart of Utah County. Uh, uh, is that what we mean when we say liberal education, that we're talking about uh, the left wing of the Democratic? You say, yes, uh, Dr. Heyer is convinced that that's what it is. Uh, let me give you a slightly different definition of that. Um, liberal, uh, uh, first of all, we might understand as a kind of education. And historically, it was the kind of education that was made available to free citizens of Greece and Rome, as opposed to the kind of education that was available to slaves, non-free, non-liberal people. One, in, in thinking about uh, that difference, one might be tempted to use a couple of Greek phrases. The kind of education that free citizens received was often referred to as episteme, whereas the kind of education that slaves received was referred to as techne. Now, you'll notice those roots uh, in uh, some words that we use today, technology uh, and epistemology. Uh, episteme was understood as knowledge, uh, and particularly as a kind of knowledge that was stable, that was immutable, that one could count on. Whereas techne was a craft, it was a skill uh, that was contingent. Uh, based on uh, particular, particular circumstances. Um, it would be really easy to grasp on to that binary opposition of episteme and techne uh, and say, well, one of them is better than the other. Uh, obviously, if free people got episteme, it must be better than the techne. Or we can jump to the 20th century and say clearly, no, obviously, the technology is superior to the episteme. But it's very clear, Nancy, I think, as we study the literature of this period, that the Greek philosophers and the Romans who followed them understood these two terms not as oppositional, but craft and knowledge, knowing about and knowing how, were two sides of the very same coin of being competent in the business of understanding what it means to be a human being. And I think the primary message that I want to be able to deliver today is that fact that we must reject the opposition between science and technology and arts and letters as somehow opposed to each other, as somehow rivals in the domains for understanding the human condition, and see them as necessary partners and companions as we go about our education. And I'll try to make a case for that as we go, we go a, little bit, uh, a little bit further. So uh, one sense of the word liberal, then, is the kind of education that a certain kind of citizen received. Another way of understanding the term liberal might be uh, a, a kind of education that itself is liberating. And I love this uh, particular statement by the classicist Peter Brown describing what the liberal arts, in particular the humanities, meant to the Romans. He says, long before the humanities became in modern times a bundle of university disciplines, they were not a subject but a mighty virtue. Humanitas, in the singular, was a central value to the ancient Romans. Humanitas meant a sense of measure based on awareness of a common human condition. Humanitas assumed that the primary duty of humans was to deal with other human beings, not with abstractions, but with persons of flesh and blood and of like passions to their own. Above all, humanitas was a virtue that needed to be fought for. To uphold a code of respect for human beings and of love for those things which helped to make them yet more human, that was never easy. It involved a moral militancy, an interesting phrase, which we should never underestimate. Humanitas involved an insistence on integrity, candor, good counsel in relation to those who wielded power, and on personal restraint in situations fraught with occasions for arrogance, sensuality, and cruelty, 
Above all, for the good Roman, it involved a strenuous attachment to wisdom and to humane good humor in the face of ignorance, false certainty and rage. Humanitas was the unwritten moral constitution of the empire. In my view, what we do in the liberal arts is much more than pursue a degree, a certification. It is all about pursuing a way of life and of interacting with other human beings during the entire course of our experience. Well, so there's a, a sense of what it might mean in terms of liberal. What about the notion of arts? What do we understand when we say liberal arts? Well, that word is kind of loaded for us. Um, our art historians think of paintings. Steve Jones thinks of notes uh, on, uh, on, the, on the piano. Uh, some people from the south side of campus might say, well, the arts are the soft and fuzzy part of the university, and then you have the hard sciences. When you set up that kind of opposition, you start to get some really unfortunate uh, associations. The arts are soft, uh, they're idealistic, they're reflective, they lead to a life of poverty. Uh, the, uh, uh, on the other side of things, uh, you know, the hard sciences are hard, they're more rigorous, uh, they're more practical, they lead to action as opposed to reflection, and they lead uh, uh, to uh, lots of money uh, in, uh, in employment. Those are the oppositions that we tend to set up when we think of art as opposed uh, to sciences. But the way that the word originally is used, ours, uh, means not just art, it also means skill. And when uh, the writers in Latin talked about liberal arts, they were really talking about liberal skills or liberal pursuits uh, that would lead uh, not only to um, a, a certain set of, of um, knowledge about the world, but a set of skills that would help them to interact in the world. And so what are the liberal arts? The liberal arts are the pursuit of a kind of knowledge and a set of skills that in themselves will be liberating. Liberating in intellectual terms, in social terms, I would say in spiritual terms, and yes, in economic terms. So having laid that foundation, let me ask the question, how many liberal arts are there? 10? Who wants to guess? Martha, how many liberal arts are there? Seven. <laughs> because she knows that already, and she knows Botticelli, a wonderful painting in the 1480s. Martha, is that about right? Um, a young man being presented to the seven liberal arts. Uh, we could go through and take 15 minutes and actually identify, I think, each one of them. But they are easier to see in a manuscript that was produced a couple of hundred years before Botticelli got around to his fresco, in which we have them um, encircling the queen of all disciplines, philosophy, of course. You can see Socrates and Plato underneath and the, and the queen of philosophy in the middle. But you'll notice at the very top you have grammar. She has a whip because, of course, students have to be beat into understanding their grammar. Uh, you have rhetoric, Nancy. You have dialectics. Those are three language-based liberal arts. They were known as the trivium. They were sort of like the uh, undergraduate, uh, lower division general education in the middle, in medieval university. You had to master the language arts before you could move on to the next four liberal arts that were known as the quadrivium. And what do they happen to be? Well, music, arithmetic, geometry, and astronomy. Um, it's very interesting if we had a lot more time, we could actually think about the way those four elements of the quadrivium, uh, at least in an idealistic uh, sense, uh, constitute what we understand as the Gothic cathedral uh, during, during the Middle Ages, but we, won't, we, don't have time, we don't have time to go into that. Um, during the Renaissance, Nancy, I think it's true um, that the pursuit of the liberal arts uh, was not done for its own sake, but in order to be able to act well, to be able to take action, to be able to do something, and primarily to be able to provide leadership uh, for the polities that were growing up around uh, these, these new universities. There was a harmony, not a tension, but there was a harmony between liberal arts, letters, 
and what at that point in history was known as natural philosophy. Natural philosophy is now what's taught on the south side of campus. But back in the Renaissance, it was considered philosophy. Physics was philosophy. Uh, uh, the biological sciences, astronomy, those were all philosophical disciplines, but they were an attempt to understand the natural world through philosophical methodology. But they were, uh, the world of poetry, the world of letters was not seen in opposition to these things. It was a complementary a complementary discipline. When we get into the 19th century, that starts to fall apart. Uh, and now these are seen as uh, asymmetrical uh, pursuits of human knowledge, and a binary opposition gets created, and science and technology begins to displace uh, letters and the liberal arts as uh, valid means of coming to understand uh, the human condition. That uh, really continues through most of the 20th century, but those of you that are paying attention are beginning to see that that's changing. And we're now beginning to go back to more of the Renaissance notion of the harmony of these two different domains of understanding our experience. There is, of course, Steve Jobs' famous sign, the crossroads, Apple as is, is at the crossroads of what? Episteme and techne, of technology and the liberal arts, and in a book that I can uh, recommend, Daniel Pink published a few years ago, A Whole New Mind, Why Right Brainers Will Rule the Future. The book isn't quite as reductive as that, but he is making the case that those of you that will be successful in the next job environment will be people who can wed both technological skills with liberal arts skills. They are not oppositional. They rely on each other. Well, what I would like to do in... Uh, in the, the time we have is to, to talk a little bit about these terms, again, of episteme and techne, perhaps in the sense of um, uh, the liberal arts as a way of being, the liberal arts to be, and the liberal arts to do. And let me see if I've got enough time to get through uh, uh, some of these slides. First of all, uh, and what I have are a number of quotations from interesting people starting in the 15th century uh, up through the 20th century. We all know Machiavelli. Uh, uh, everybody wanted to have an uncle like Machiavelli, right? Uh, a dear relative, a kindly gentleman, um, uh, famous uh, for writing uh, The Prince, of course, that great treatise uh, on, uh, on uh, statesmanship. Um, in 1513, he wrote a letter to a friend that historians pay great attention to because it is in that letter where he describes... Um, uh, the composition of the prince. But I love this quote that comes before that particular portion. He says, describing his own habits of reading, he says, when, I, when evening comes, I return to my home and I go into my study, and on the threshold I take off my everyday clothes, which are covered with mud and mire, and I put on regal robes. And dressed in a more appropriate manner, I enter into the ancient courts of ancient men and am welcomed by them kindly. I love that notion of dressing to read. I actually have a colleague at the University of Washington who does that, comes in from playing tennis. He must shower and dress properly before picking up a book. There's something marvelously respectful uh, about the world of ideas in that, in that habit. And there I am not ashamed to speak to them, to ask them the reasons for their actions, and they and their humanity answer me. And I feel no boredom. I dismiss every affliction. I no longer fear poverty, nor do I tremble at the thought of death. I become completely part of them. One of the beings of liberal arts is to read passionately and with insight. You'll notice that this is not passive reading. This is not Machiavelli just sitting there wondering how many pages he needs to get through uh, in order to not be embarrassed at class the next day. This is reading as exchange, as conversation, as dialogue. He asks questions. The books respond back. They're engaged in conversation until in a very important intellectual sense, he becomes one of them. That's what the liberal arts can do for us if we approach it properly. 19th century wonderful fellow by the name of John Henry Cardinal Newman. Uh, you uh, might recognize Cardinal Newman because he wrote uh, the hymn, Lead Kindly Light. Uh, he also, in the 1850s, wrote a very important book called The Idea of a University that I strongly recommend. Uh, and in that uh, book, he gives us the following 
wisdom. The student profits by an intellectual tradition, which is independent of particular teachers, which guides him in his choice of subjects and duly interprets for him those which he chooses. He apprehends the great outlines of knowledge, the principles on which it rests. That's interesting. Specifics and theoretical principles. The scale of its parts, its lights and its shades, its great points and its little, as he otherwise cannot apprehend them. Hence, it is that his education is called liberal. A habit of mind is formed, which lasts through life, of which the attributes are freedom, equitableness, calmness, moderation, and wisdom. This, then, I would assign as the special fruit of the education furnished at a university, as contrasted with other places of teaching. This is the main purpose of a university in its treatment of its students. I love this idea of a liberal education allowing us to understand the great outlines and the underlying principles, to be able to make connections between peoples and tongues and languages and times, um, uh, to, be under, to be able to understand the interrelatedness of human experience. That is one of the primary virtues that one who aspires to be liberally educated will attain. Next, there's a British political philosopher, conservative political philosopher. I just wanted to make that clear that we could quote conservatives in a conversation about liberal education. Michael Oakeshott, um, who was one who argued, uh, by the way, uh, that uh, poetry, and by poetry he meant uh, the arts in general, uh, had lost uh, or been denied its voice in the great human conversation. Uh, because uh, the sciences were screaming so loudly and argued uh, that uh, poetry needed uh, to uh, find its voice uh, again at that, at that table. In defining conversation, we have this. This is actually in an obituary that was written for Oakeshott when he died about 20 years ago. Conversation for Oakeshott was not merely the preferred pedagogical method. It was for him the very basis of education and a metaphor for civilization itself. The languages of science and mathematics, of arts and letters, of sport, religion, the trades and the professions were all for him part of a conversation that made up the human inheritance. Can you see how he's breaking down oppositions? He's saying all of these domains of understanding human experience um, are voices of the conversation that we need to become fluent in. Only in entering this conversation could one become fully human. Education was everywhere the price of entry. The ultimate business of education then was learning to be a human being. It might include training in a trade or a skill or a discipline, but to focus on the merely employable or certifiable aspects of education truncated one's vision of human possibility. The teacher, however, humble his sphere, had to be understood and respected and to understand and respect himself as the agent par excellence of civilization. And I love this last line. It inspires me at the beginning of every school year. The calling of the teacher was neither more nor less than to initiate the pupil into the conversation of mankind. One of the virtues of a liberal education then is becoming fluent in all of the voices of the conversation of mankind, episteme, techne, science, math, art, poetry. Another voice, Neil Postman. Neil Postman was a media critic, professor at New York University, a writer of terrific books. And by the way, I'm going to have a number of books that I put up here on the screen that I highly recommend uh, you uh, look at uh, in all of the spare time that you have. Uh, Neil Postman, in, in uh, one of his books, uh, The End of Education, uh, has a wonderful chapter on language. Uh, and on narratives that are spun. He, the, the book is all about the defining narratives of Western civilization and which narratives need to be jettisoned, which narratives are not helpful to us, such as 
in Postman's words, the narrative of economic utility. He finds that a narrative that is not constructive to Western society and instead proposes more healthy narratives. Well, one of the narratives that he proposes is around the way language works. And he suggests that we need to be much more attentive in our education into exactly the way our language functions in building our understanding uh, of the world around us. He says, for example, a metaphor is not an ornament, as we might learn in my Spanish 339 class. Uh, it's not just a trick that a poet plays. Uh, a metaphor is an organ of perception. I love that notion. And he goes on to explain that. He says, for example, in the, in the ancient uh, Jewish Mishnah, um, they used four different metaphors for learning. Learning might be a sponge. It might be a funnel. It might be a strainer. Or it might be a sieve. And then he asks, which is the best metaphor for education? Well, it can't be a sponge. That soaks up everything indiscriminately of what is worthy of being retained and not. The funnel, that's not so good. In one end, out the other. The strainer, the strainer you pour the wine through, or I suppose the grape juice, and it lets the wine go through and retains the dregs. That's kind of the opposite. But the sieve, the sieve lets through the dust and retains the fine flour. Well, Metaphors, um, the ones that we choose to use to describe our experience, affect uh, our very perception and experience. Um, and he says uh, here at the bottom, world making through language is a narrative of power, durability, and inspiration. It is the story of how we make ourselves known to the world. It is a story that plays a role in all other narratives. For whatever we believe in or don't believe in is to a considerable extent the function of how our language addresses the world. And so we have and we and all of my colleagues here would come up with a different list, but we have four possible ways of being associated with a liberal arts education. To read with passion and insight, to see the great outlines of human experience, to become fluent in the human conversation, and to become sensitive users and consumers of of language. Now, all of this requires work. A liberal arts education is of no value if we do not pursue it with rigor, with passion, with excitement, and unapologetically. Um, as I am fond of telling my children, something that I learned from a professor of mine many years ago, that which is easy is never satisfying for very long. None of the skills that I mentioned above can be acquired through laziness or through lack of passion or discipline that we bring to our studies. And I love this notion by Erasmus. It's actually, Erasmus loved this particular adage, this particular notion. It actually has its origins clear back in the times of the Emperor Augustus in Rome and came through the Middle Ages in a variety of forms. But it's the, the Latin phrase festina lente, which means literally to hasten slowly. And the emblem that was used to describe this adage was the dolphin wrapped around an anchor, a dolphin suggesting tradition and restraint and patience, the anchor suggesting forward motion, urgency, uh, pursuit of a goal. Um, what uh, Erasmus says is this about this particular uh, adage, if to make haste slowly is not forgotten, which means the right timing and the right degree, governed alike by vigilance and patience, so that nothing regrettable is done through haste and nothing left undone through sloth that may, that may contribute to the well-being of the commonwealth, could any student be more successful more stable and firmly rooted than this. I love this notion in our studies of being patient and thorough and rooted in not just tradition, but in scholarship uh, and in what uh, uh, great minds have said before, but to do so with an urgency of moving forward or pursuit, pursuing our, our goals. Festina lente sounds like a paradox, but in that paradox there is a great truth about how we should pursue our liberal arts education. So that's the to be part. I firmly believe that a preparation in liberal arts helps us to be something. It helps us to be 
good readers. It helps us to be good users of language. It helps us to be fluent in the human conversation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it also helps us to do things. Our very own Brigham Young, you can find this in the founding documents of the university in the aims of a BYU education, said this, education is the power to think clearly. Sounds like liberal arts. The power to act well in the world's work and the power to appreciate life. Appreciate life sounds like liberal arts. Well, what about the power to act well in the world's work? Well, no, I better get that someplace else on campus. Not true. And uh, what I'd like to do in the next couple of minutes is just share with you some of the things that we have been learning about why liberal arts prepare us to act well in the world's work. First of all, let me just share a couple of citations. The first one refers to a study. This was reported in the Chronicle of Higher Education a few years ago. Um, uh, where 305 executives were asked uh, what skills that they thought uh, 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 colleges and universities ought to instill in their students. What were great corporate leaders expecting to find in their future employees? And what did they respond? Top three choices. Teamwork skills, critical thinking, and analytical, analytic reasoning skills, and oral and written communication. That sounds like the liberal arts to me. Um, and then a dean of a business school, not our own dean of the business school, although I think, our, I, think, I think our dean would probably agree with this as well, said the following, learning how to think critically, how to imaginatively frame questions, and consider multiple perspectives has historically been associated with a liberal arts education not a business school curriculum. So this change, presumably in business school curricula of the future, represents something of a tectonic shift for business school leaders. The liberal arts desire is to produce holistic thinkers who think broadly and make these important moral decisions. Now, one of the books that has caused uh, the most um, uh, trembling uh, this year in higher education is a study that was produced at the beginning of the year called Academically Adrift, uh, or what was the subtitle, Why Colleges and Universities Are Failing Our Children and Grandchildren. So it was some very cheery title like that. Uh, and it was a, a comprehensive uh, study um, of uh, colleges and universities across the United States in which uh, students were subjected to the collegiate learning assessment, a test, that would measure their achievement in three areas, critical thinking, complex reasoning, and writing. The study found that American university students weren't learning much in any of those three areas, that we weren't having much effect unless they were humanities and social science students, or science and math students. Um, now, I don't want to make any comment about those with short bars. You know, don't want to go down that road. Uh, but what I am trying to suggest um, is that precisely the kinds of skills that erroneously have been considered soft skills that come from a study of the liberal arts, are now many of the hard skills that we are finding that employers are seeking for. And it appears that those skills are being acquired at a disproportionate rate among students of what we traditionally call the liberal arts. You can get much more information about this on our website free of charge. You don't have to pay to subscribe. It's called humanitiesplus.byu.edu. Every week, sometimes more often, there is a posting. A posting that helps students of the liberal arts, in our case specifically students of the humanities, but the information is applicable to all students of the liberal arts, that will help them identify what is being said outside of the university about the value of a liberal arts education. 
Sometimes they are studies, sometimes they're articles in the Chronicle of Education, sometimes they are comments made by CEOs, sometimes they are postings of opportunities uh, for companies that are coming to interview and who are looking specifically for liberal arts students. We would encourage you um, to uh, take advantage of this uh, resource. It will help you, I am quite sure, become more articulate about why you are majoring in a liberal art and just what that liberal art can do for you as you leave campus. Part of our effort to, um, to get a handle on the relationship between a liberal arts education and what happens after we leave the university, <clears throat> in other words, how we help each other build a bridge between the liberal arts education and the world of work that awaits us, is what we have been calling in my college Humanities Plus or Plus Humanities. Let me describe Humanities Plus briefly. Humanities Plus says this to our humanities students. Congratulations. You have chosen a terrific major. You need to be proud of that major. You need to pursue that major with passion and with excitement and become the best reader, the best writer, the best thinker that you can possibly become and never apologize to anyone. Never feel like you need to make excuses for having majored in English or in Spanish or in any of the other majors in our college. But we're saying we want you to supplement that primary experience with a suite of optional activities that will help you leverage your first-rate liberal arts education when you leave BYU. Well, what might some of those optional activities be? Well, internships, for example, uh, participating in the honors program. We think that's a great way to turbocharge a liberal arts education. Uh, to get a minor uh, or a double major in an area that is unrelated uh, or not closely related. We are working out this fall, for example, with the School of Business to try to create a major in international business that would have a high language requirement and that we think would be of particular interest to students of the humanities and would help them leverage again uh, their liberal arts training with uh, future employment that might be coming. But we also say we think that there is a place for plus humanities. And that is if you are a chemist or a biologist or an engineer or a physicist, terrific. The world needs all of those professions. Um, we rely on competent people in those areas to drive our economies and to provide uh, the, much of the lifestyle that we have become accustomed to. Terrific. We're glad you're majoring in those things. But we think that in a global world, not just a global economy, but a global culture, um, that your education might be enriched if you were to acquire some humanities content to go along with your uh, uh, technological degree. How have we done that? Well, one of the ways is uh, uh, through what uh, our college does as well as any place uh, in the world, really, which is language. Uh, we're saying uh, supplement your language experience. You've served a mission. You've learned languages other places. Uh, find some ways to build on those language experiences so that your language can become a tool in your particular domain of knowledge and so it can enrich you in your life uh, for the remainder of your years. To facilitate that, uh, we have created in the last year language certificates that uh, for students who are not able to uh, find the time to do a minor uh, or to do a major in a foreign language, they can, with, through a combination of three courses and sitting for a, an internationally recognized uh, examination in oral and written proficiency, can walk away with a certificate that indicates they have a certain level of competency um, in the language of your choice. We think that that is a terrific way uh, to add a credential uh, to non-liberal arts majors. We've also uh, created secondary majors for those who want to go a little bit further. If you have a primary major in history, uh, but you would love uh, to be able to do a, a, a major in French, uh, we can uh, accommodate that for fewer hours than would be required if you did the French major uh, by itself. What we're trying to do is increase uh, the total amount of language 
study that is taking place on this campus because we think that that is one of the great uh, things that distinguishes BYU from other universities around, around the world. I have six minutes and 10 pieces of advice and one story. I can do that in six minutes. Here are the 10 pieces of advice. To make your liberal arts degree something uh, that you can uh, both leverage in the world of work and that can become indeed a way of living, a way of being for the rest of your life, I suggest these 10 things. If I were to come up with another list next week, they might be 10 different things. But this is a pretty good start. First, go to our Humanities Plus blog. I've already talked about that. Spend time on it every week. You'll get some information that will be really helpful to you. Second, read newspapers. Um, newspapers are being replaced by um, a less profound source of information about the world around us. Uh, long articles being replaced by sound bites, by short bits of information. We need to read newspapers, good newspapers, and I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to say anything bad about the Daily Universe. The Daily Universe has a very important function on campus, but it can't be your source of news about this complex world that we live in. The New York Times can, the Washington Post can, the Los Angeles Times can, uh, most of the, or, or El País in Madrid, or uh, 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 the, the, we could go to major newspapers in uh, countries uh, all around the world. Reading from a great newspaper every day will help you follow the counsel of the 88th section of the Doctrine and Covenants. I won't go any further in that, but you know, know what I'm talking about. Non-compulsory reading. Jorge Luis Borges, the great Argentine writer, said, I hate compulsory reading. You're having to do a lot of reading in class. You need to be reading stuff in addition to what we are assigning you. And you need to turn off the TV in order to do it. One of the great cultural changes that has taken place in higher ed since I was a student from the time that you were a student is the ubiquitousness of televisions in apartments. When I was your age, nobody had televisions in their apartments. Now, we have to you know, put in our Covey planner time to make sure that we get our favorite show in. Get rid of the TV and read a good book. Uh, what about C-SPAN? Um, well, C-SPAN is fine, but, it's not, <laughs> but it's, not, it's not the same thing as the kind of conversation that Machiavelli was having with the great books in his study, and that's the kind of experience that we need to have if we're really going to uh, leverage our liberal arts education. Campus culture, Dean Jones, We've got some of the best stuff in any university in the United States. Plays, concerts, uh, lecture series, devotionals, and forums. Uh, for a liberal arts student, those are an essential part of our curriculum. They're not extracurricular. They are a critical part of our curriculum and would encourage you to take advantage of those things. Ask a good question today. Every day when I tell my 16-year-old daughter goodbye, goodbye, Marie, I love you, ask a good question today. Develop that habit. Every time you go to class, prepare yourself in such a way that you can ask a good question. Discover what your professors hang on their walls. In order to do that, you have to be in their offices. I would encourage you to know by the end of this semester what every one of your professors has hanging on his or her wall. By discovering that, conversations will start to take place that will, um, again, enrich your liberal arts education. Consider an honors degree. You don't have to have a 36 ACT or a 4.0 GPA. Anybody can do honors. Consider an internship. We've learned that internships for liberal arts students are no longer a luxury. They are absolutely critical to building that bridge to the world of work. Learn a second language. Well, the superior level that I'm mentioning there is the level uh, that the test takers, the test creators tell us is required in order for you to use that language in a professional setting. That should be the goal of every liberal arts student. And finally, be passionate, be excited, be rigorous, demand a lot of yourselves, don't give up too early. And finally, the story in the last couple of minutes. John Gardner, in his very polemical book from the 1970s called On Moral Fiction, uh, tells this particular story. 
He says, it was said in the old days that every year Thor made a circle around the Middle Earth, beating back the enemies of order. Thor got older every year, and the circle occupied by the gods and men grew smaller. The wisdom god, Vodun, pictured here, went out to the king of the trolls, got in, in him an arm lock, and demanded to know of him how order might triumph over chaos. Give me your left eye, said the king of the trolls, and I'll tell you. Without hesitation, Vodun gave up his left eye. You can see he doesn't have a left eye in the picture. Now tell me, demanded Vodun. The troll said, the secret is, watch with both eyes. What I would like you to remember from this presentation is that um, we must see the world stereoscopically. It is not arts or sciences. It is not episteme or techni. It is seeing the world with both eyes. And that what we need to pursue uh, as liberal arts students is the ability to see with depth and clarity using both eyes. And I hope we've said a few things uh, today that will help you in that pursuit. Thank you very much for your time.